Hi, my name's Tim and I teach fire. Today we'll be generating heat well in excess of a thousand degrees Celsius. Do not try this at home. There are two parts to a fire. When carbon oxidizes, it generates heat. Heat breaks wood down into fuel and waste in a messy business called pyrolysis. Some carbon is ejected as flame or soot, but most of it's left behind here to do the real work at this boundary because wood doesn't burn and flames are a bunch of old rubbish. And we're going to demonstrate this today by setting a log on fire with a magnifying glass. This is not a magic trick. Decaying wood has a lower ignition point and this has already caught a couple of sparks, leaving tiny wells of carbon behind that are begging to be set off by the sun's rays. And here we go. What I'm doing here is initiating and encouraging the oxidation process to create a larger reaction. Every time I blow on this and encourage my little chain reaction, carbon meets oxygen and heat energy is released that breaks the wood underneath it down into things that do burn. That's pyrolysis. It releases an array of flammable gases and water as steam, and it also leaves behind a lot of carbon. If we introduce a simple air pump, we can greatly accelerate this process, but first, Let's get this log out into a bucket. Nice. I'm restarting this log with a little pine cone. You can see how easy it is to activate the oxidation process with a small combustion reaction and then accelerate it with a simple channel of air. So much so that we are now literally drilling through the wood. The wall of coal oxidizes, transforming wood on the far side of it into new fuel, creating a fresh wall of coal, so on and so forth. When you're blowing on a fire, this is the process you are seeking to accelerate. This here is the heart of fire. All of that smoke, junk. If you saw any flames, they'd be junk too, but they're not necessary, so we're making do without and getting by just fine. Focus on the solid carbon disappearing into carbon dioxide before your very eyes as it glows orange and disappears into the atmosphere in a way that's imperceptible to your vision. This is oxidation. Also hidden from your vision because it's happening at a molecular level behind the oxidation reaction, there's wood transforming into charcoal as molecules are broken down by heat into carbon and a bunch of gas and junk. The amount of flammable gas that's being created is not enough to create any flame you can perceive, but the big orange flames that you're expecting and not seeing right now would come from a large amount of carbon being ejected by the reaction and igniting in the atmosphere above it, if we allowed our reaction to reach this stage. But let's watch again as we carve through this log with nothing but a gust of air and oxidation for a little Bonnie Tyler moment before we finally bring some flames out to play. Oh. As you can see, it's not entirely necessary, but pyrolysis can be accelerated to a point where a bunch of carbon is thrown clear of the reaction, where it oxidizes above the main reaction in an audacious display of light and heat that's a complete waste of everybody's time. All of the real action takes place here at the coal face. Fibers of cellulose and lignin break down, leaving charcoal riddled with tiny channels through which gas can escape. And for my next trick, I'm going to push solid matter through these same channels using some logs I prepared earlier. Much earlier. Coal is coal. It can't go off. It can only oxidize. So restarting one of these year old chambers is as easy as lighting it with a match or a little bit of cotton. I want to talk you through the process first and we'll take a long close look. You can see a bit of wooden charcoal in the chamber. You can see this igniting over time, but even before then we had oxidation reactions ticking over in the walls. It's these we focus on till we create an oxidation and pyrolysis combination that's intense enough to not only eject gas through those little channels, but a bunch of waste carbon too. That's when you see in here some serious flame action. So let's extinguish our first sample, move on to our main chamber for today's big show. Rather than show off with a bit of cotton or a magnifying glass, this time I've created a proper little fire to start our reaction. I've included a coal briquette that we'll be using to generate further heat and reflect it back on the wall of charcoal. What we're waiting for here is for the heat to grow so intense behind that wall that the disintegrating wood tries to eject not only gas and steam through the tiny channels, but also a bunch of excess carbon grouped into microscopic clusters. Wait for it. Wait for it. There it is. That is the sound of coal rushing through coal, bursting forth before it meets with oxygen and oxidizes in midair, collectively creating the orange show-offs we call flame. Leaving the charcoal briquette in place here helps to demonstrate how dense this charcoal is compared to the charcoal in the walls. This should help you better appreciate how solid matter flows so freely through the channels left by the pyrolyzed material. We won't need that coal anymore, so out it goes. As you can see, the chamber produces temperatures well in excess of 300 degrees Celsius at rest. 
I don't own a thermometer that goes higher than that, but coal displays different colours when oxidising and these are determined by temperature. Blood red starts at about 600 degrees Celsius, cherry red indicates up to 900, orange indicates near to 1000 degrees Celsius, yellow starts around 1200 and white around 1300 or 1400 degrees Celsius. Coal doesn't get much hotter than that outside of a forge and all of that is visible here in my little chamber right before the flames burst through and ruin the view for everybody. And there it is ladies and gentlemen, flames the jazz hands of fire. Ooh, look at us, we're fire. It doesn't take very long for the pyrolysis reaction to creep around the edges of our oxidation reaction. Once that happens, a wick effect also feeds the flames, doing away with all the needless rushing through walls, making life far too easy for these terrible show-offs. So what I'm gonna to have to do eventually is use a watering can to wet down the mouth of our chamber to prevent pyrolysis from spilling out over the edges and force it to come through the walls, because that's awesome, and I know you wanna see it again. What you see here is solar energy being released because wood works like a storage battery for solar energy and we release it with fire. Solar energy was stored in the plant when it used the sun's rays to power photosynthesis, taking water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2, to create complex organic compounds that lock hydrogen, some oxygen, and most importantly carbon into cellulose and lignin molecules that can later be broken by raising their temperature just enough until they start to fall apart. And when that happens and carbon is allowed to reunite with oxygen in an excited state, that is where the stored solar energy is released and that is where the real heat of your fire comes from. Wood is made of a combination of cellulose and lignin. Lignin is more complex and so locks away more carbon atoms. Therefore, hardwood trees such as ash or oak that have more lignin burn with more intensity than those that are comparatively high in cellulose, such as willow or pine, because it's all about how much carbon is locked away in that tree. And you can fill a lot of carbon atoms into a complex molecule. To put it even more simply, trees that take longer to grow, like a yew tree, take longer to burn because they've collected more solar energy over time and converted more H2O and CO2 into the solid mass we need to heat just enough to break down those molecules and unlock the carbon that loves oxygen so much that it longs to unite with it in a hug so warm that it can set the world on fire. And that is the heart of fire. I hope we've all learned something valuable about fire today and maybe even something about love. I'll close by pointing out there were no ads or endorsements in this educational video. I still have a Patreon account for anyone who cares, but right now it looks a little bit like this. I know times are tough for a lot of people, but if you can afford to support or even promote or encourage me in some small way, I can continue to make videos. I appreciate you taking the time to at least let people know that oxidation is the true heart of fire, and even the smallest reaction can grow mighty with only the tiniest amount of encouragement. Cheers all, be well, be careful.